Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll have the latest on a lawsuit challenging Arizona's same-sex marriage ban. And we'll speak with Arizona's new Supreme Court Chief Justice. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Medical marijuana will soon be allowed for use by those suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Arizona Department of Health Services Director Will Humble made the decision today, a month after an administrative judge ruled that medical marijuana should be allowed for those with PTSD. Last year, Humble denied use of the drug for those with the disorder. Patients with PTSD can start using marijuana to relieve their symptoms starting January 1st. And officials from the Secretary of State's office say an investigation of possible campaign violations by Attorney General Tom Horn is warranted. Secretary of State's office reviewed allegations by former Horn employee Sarah Beatty and found that Attorney General staffers did spend time working on Horn's campaign during office hours. The findings were passed on to the state solicitor general, but because that office reports to Horn, the investigation will be handed off to an agency outside of the Attorney General's office. Both sides in a lawsuit against Arizona's same-sex marriage ban want a federal judge to decide the case without having to go to a full trial. Associated Press reporter Bob Christie is covering the story. He joins us now. It's good to have you here. Now, that, give us the background on this case. This was what uh, uh, filed in March. Who, who, who did the filing? This was filed by uh, Lambda Legal on behalf of seven same-sex couples in Arizona uh, who want to be able to, allowed, to be allowed to be married. Um, there's a second case that's also working its way through in Arizona. It was filed a couple months earlier involving another group of couples. They're both uh, relatively raise the same issues. Um, the bottom line is that they believe that it's unconstitutional, that, they, that they, uh, they're banned from being married. They believe the state law that, that prevents that, which is in the state constitution, is, should be overturned based on constitutional grounds. Basically, uh, equal protection and due process, those clauses of the U.S. Constitution violated, they say. Correct. The Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment are Now, at again, issue. Then the, the, this law was, goes back to, what, 1996 or something along those lines, correct? Correct. The law was passed by the legislature in 1996. It was challenged uh, in, the federal, in the state courts. Uh, the Arizona Court of Appeals said it was okay several years later. And then in 2008, voters approved a constitutional amendment, which basically put it in the state constitution. So it's enshrined there, which makes it even, you know, make the legislature would be able to, to get rid of it anyway unless they went back to voters. So it once upheld and then the voters put it into the constitution. Interesting scenario there. Also interesting is that both sides want the judge to decide and not go to a full trial. What's that all about? Well, in this case, the, the facts really aren't at issue. I mean, everyone knows that, uh, everyone knows what the basic facts are. Um, this has been uh, argued quite, quite a lot around the United States over the last couple years. So there aren't any real facts that need to be uh, decided by the judge other than does it actually uh, fail the constitutional test as set up by the U.S. Supreme Court. And that's what's interesting because last year the Supreme Court struck down a major portion of the Defense of Marriage Act, that's a federal act, mm -hmm. on constitutional grounds, on Fifth Amendment grounds. And since that time, federal judges across the United States in, uh, I believe, 11 states in the last year and a half have struck down state bans. Those are all being appealed right now. Uh, Arizona is kind of slow to the game. Ours didn't get filed. Uh, a lot of those cases were filed the last couple, three years and are working their way closer than ours are now. So, and, and again, I, it sounds like the Ninth Circuit is already considering a couple of these cases, Idaho, I think in Nevada, something, I think on one of the cases a, a, a ban was struck down by a judge and another it was upheld. But the, regardless, the Ninth is looking at this. Uh, is the idea of not going to a full trial is that the judge will find out what the Ninth says and kind of get the, get the hint? Part of it is that. Uh, part of it is that, uh, like I said, it's all, it's all legal arguments that really don't have any facts that require a, a, a finder of fact, a judge, to hear new evidence. Um, it's going to be filed. The judge in the case is pretty interesting. He's an Alaska U.S. district judge who's sitting in, happens to have the case in Arizona. He's on senior status, which means he's been around a long time and he's technically retired, but in federal system you never really retire unless you're incapacitated. You keep taking cases and he has this case. Uh, because Arizona has more cases than Alaska does. Um, and he's a George H.W. Bush appointee. Um, he's known to, uh, to make his decisions off of paperwork. Mm -hmm. Rather than doesn't necessarily think that 
trials that are necessary you know, in a lot of civil cases. He likes to do what they call summary judgments, which is give me the pleadings, let me read the documents, give me all the paperwork, and I'll tell you what the law is. Um, so he will, uh, if he takes a suggestion from the parties, he will not have to have a trial, and he could rule. Uh, the schedule right now is to get all the filings by the end of October. The second case I told, I told you about is closer to being briefed. Both of them are in John Sedgwick's hand. He's the federal judge in, in Alaska. He, uh, one would think he would wait until he has briefings on both of those to pop out rulings, but who knows? And, and again, we're, we're talking about, real quickly, uh, oral arguments, there is a split regarding whether or not there should be oral arguments. Why? There is. Well, it's kind of interesting. This, the, <laughs> the Lambda Legal lawyers say we don't need oral arguments. There are several uh, motion issues which have to do with technicalities that the state wants to argue. Um, I don't know if the, if the judge will go along with that or not. Um, for, the, for the plaintiffs and the defendants, um, it, it's probably not necessary at this point, I wouldn't think, to have oral arguments, but you know, that's up for the judge to decide. And as far as a timeline is concerned, this, this Utah ban seems like that's the one that's headed toward the Supreme Court. We've had Supreme Court shows here, Paul Bender here is basically saying it's very likely the Supreme Court will look at this, U.S. Supreme Court will look at this next year. How does that play into all this? Well, you know, it's kind of funny. If you've watched the news over the last year since the Defense of Marriage Act decision by the Supreme Court, there are federal judges all the way across the country who are striking down these bans. Uh, the Ninth Circuit, as we said, is going to take it up. The, uh, the Fourth Circuit in Denver struck down uh, or upheld Utah's, up, upheld the federal judge who struck down Utah's. Utah today appealed that directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. There's another district, uh, I'm sorry, it's the Fourth District in Virginia is next up. They have a case about ready to decide. Uh, the Supreme Court generally doesn't take cases if, unless they're split circuits. So if we get every circuit around the country who all says, yes, you, these are unconstitutional, I don't know if the, if the Supreme Court will weigh in or not. I mean, nobody wants to second-guess judges, as yes. your next guest will tell you, yes. uh, probably. <laughs> yes. um, uh, so bottom line, I mean, the Arizona ban could be gone by the end of the year. Absolutely. Uh, when Judge Sedgwick rules, uh, what's been happening with these cases around the country is once a federal judge strikes it down, he puts it on hold, he or she puts it on hold until it's up to the appeals court. But with the Utah uh, direct appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court today and with the Virginia Fourth Circuit decision due out at any time and the Ninth going to hear arguments in, you know, in September, they, I wouldn't think, they've already had a, you know, last year the U.S. Supreme Court upheld uh, California's uh, uh, same-sex marriage uh, overturning Proposition 8 in California. So uh, I would think that that's, re that's primed and ready to go, too. I wouldn't think the Ninth needs a lot. Uh, the reason the Ninth took that case, by the way, is because in 2012, Nevada, this was before DOMA, mm -hmm. a federal judge in Nevada upheld Nevada's same-sex ban, and then after DOMA, a separate judge in Idaho struck down Idaho's ban. So that's why they took that case, because there is a split in, yes. the, in the circuit. We, and again, because, because Idaho was struck down and Nevada was upheld, the idea perhaps is, you know, forget the full trial, forget the jury. You're going to find out what the Ninth Circuit is going to say with both of these cases. Let the judge go ahead and do a summary judgment. We'll move on. Absolutely. I uh, think that's what it is. And, and when, what are we looking for timeline here as far as this case? Uh, well, like I said, uh, the, the one case should be fully briefed by the end of this month. The second case that I wrote about yesterday will be fully briefed by the end of October. I would suspect the judge has no reason to wait after that. He could, we could get a decision on the second case early in November if they have arguments. Wow. Bob, good stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. You bet. Anytime. Inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. 
get the Aid Insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Arizona has a new Supreme Court Chief Justice. Scott Bales took over July 1st after being elected to the post by his peers, and he joins us now to discuss his plans for the court and for advancing justice in Arizona. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. And congratulations. It is congratulations, correct? <laughs> it is. It is. Okay. You know, the process for our court is, is different than the Supreme Court of the United States because, as you mentioned, I was chosen to be chief by my colleagues. It's uh, under our Constitution, a choice that the justices make, and there's something of a tradition that we pick the, the person on the court with the most seniority on our court who's not yet served. And that's you. That's me. All right. And you've now got a new strategic agenda out there. Mm -hmm. First of all, why is a new strategic agenda needed? Well, the um, strategic agendas have a, a five-year time span, and that um, coincides with the tenure of the Chief Justice, the terms for five years. So it's, it's sort of natural that as a new Chief Justice takes office, it's a, it's a time to reassess the things the court's doing, identify some new initiatives, uh, give priorities to certain things, and that's really what the new ad agenda reflects. And indeed, it sounds like, I want to get to some of the finer points here, but the overriding goal seems to be access to justice. Talk to us about that. Well, um, it is the overriding goal. The overall theme is advancing justice together, and, and one distinct goal is um, efforts to promote access to justice. Ted, what that really reflects is, is a recognition of our circumstances in Arizona. Um, our, our state's population is, is different than the, the country overall. We're both younger and older. We have a, a high portion of people in our state who are 18 or younger, a high portion as compared to the rest of the country, over 65. We also have a, a large population of people for whom English is not their first language. And um, unfortunately in our state we have a, a high percentage as compared to the rest of the country who are, are poor. And each one of those factors creates distinct demands on the court system. A large population of young people means that we have particular needs in our juvenile courts. Um, a large number of people who uh, cannot afford lawyers means that we need to pay special attention to how we make services available to people who might be self-represented or better provide lawyers for, for people who can't afford them. As far as those uh, the modest, low-income folks, how do you better serve their needs? Well, one, one thing we're looking at under that part of the agenda is um, how do you help those people who are self-represented through things like self-service centers, court information available online. Um, one thing that we're hoping to explore is whether non-lawyer assistance of one kind or another might be provided. And um, one thing we're going to do as part of the plan, and it's actually now in the works, is we're going to establish a statewide access to justice commission. I've asked uh, one of our judges from the Court of Appeals, Larry Winthrop, to head that commission. And it will be tasked with identifying very discrete strategies of how we can better help people um, have meaningful access to our courts. And it's, it's not just in terms of those who cannot afford attorneys, although that's an important part of it. It's, it's more broadly people who may choose to represent themselves or people who in fact have lawyers but um, understandably want to see that the process is um, efficient and as inexpensive as possible. And as understandable right. as possible. I would think these self-represented litigants, one of the biggest things you could do to help them is to help them understand court process, help them to understand even the documents they're dealing with. That, I would think that that would be pretty intimidating for some of these, for a lot of folks. You're right, and that's something that we've given attention to and that we're going to continue to um, focus on. Over the last several years, we, we made an effort to simplify the court rules for our justice courts. It took a lot of time, but it, it was successful. Now we're beginning to look towards other court rules um, f for the same reasons you've mentioned, that, that the court processes ought to be as simple and understandable as possible. For those uh, with uh, limited English proficiency, uh, first of all, don't we already have services there for those folks? A a so what needs to be improved? Well, we, we have a range of services. There are interpreter services in, in most of the courts around the state. 
Um, some of the forms that people use in courts are in, mm -hmm. available in translations. Um, we need to make sure, though, that, that our reach is statewide and that the coverage in terms of the, the types of forms that are available cover the, the range of cases, the range of things that people need to do in our courts. Um, we have, over the last year, made great strides in terms of posting online a large number of forms that are translated into Spanish so that in order for people to understand them, they can access them, whether it's a family law case or a contract case or other kinds of cases. And that's been done um, with, with the help of the Maricopa County Superior Courts. They've really been leaders in that regard. So you can now go online either at our court's website or at the website for the Superior Court and access that information. There are also um, court interpreter services available um, in Spanish, but there are many other languages in, involved in, in our court proceedings. Something we're trying to do in that regard is make available more broadly remote video court interpreting. So you could have a person here that might speak a somewhat exotic language, but they'd be able to participate in a court proceeding, say, up in Mojave County. I was going to ask about that, the idea of remote electronic court appearances, just in general. Mm -hmm. Where does that stand? And, and if, even for, like, uh, uh, filing documents, uh, e-filing, and maybe filing payments uh, and these sorts of things, is that developing? Where, where are we with that right now? Well, it is developing. It's, it's hard for courts or for any um, other public entity to keep up with the technology because it's always changing and the, and the costs are a challenge. Um, we are working towards implementing e-filing more broadly across the state. It's available for some courts. Um, for example, in our appellate courts, things are electronically filed routinely. Um, but we haven't achieved that at every level of the courts statewide. Um, in terms of an e-payment system, that's one of the things we're going to work towards under the new agenda so that the payment of fines and um, traffic tickets, mm -hmm. for example, could be done in a purely electronic way. Is there a concern for privacy when it comes to all this technology? That is a, that's a fair point. Something we've, we've wrestled with as we've moved towards providing for electronic access to documents is what kind of information should be shielded because in, in court cases obviously sometimes sensitive information is put into the court documents and we've actually adopted some rules that would limit um, remote access to certain kinds of sensitive information, sensitive personal information. But it's, you know, it's a fair concern that comes up in many contexts mm -hmm. now as, as the internet's become prevalent and as e-technology is basically pervasive in our lives. And we occasionally hear of folks getting to places where they shouldn't right. be. Um, the, the, the idea of expanding problem-solving courts. First of all, what are problem-solving courts and why are they necessary? Why should they be expanded? Well, what, what you're asking about is an aspect of, of the second goal that's identified in the new agenda, and that is protecting children, families, and communities. And this is something that, like promoting access to justice, has, has long been an important concern for our courts. Problem-solving courts um, are, are usually um, some type of specialty court that recognizes that beyond deciding a particular case, the court might be able to deal with the issues that gave rise to the case in the first place. And a good example is a drug court. A um, person might be arrested for a low-level drug offense, and, and one way to handle it would be to simply process the case and send the people on their way. Another approach and one that's been successfully implemented in Arizona and, and in other places around the country is to say, well, look, that might reflect a, a, an underlying problem of substance abuse for which the person needs to have some counseling or some other services. If we can help them get that, it might deal with the problem as opposed to just dealing with the symptom. And we've experimented with those kinds of courts in the area of drug courts, in mental health courts. Mm -hmm. We have pilot projects around the state for veterans courts. And, and in Arizona, that's an important issue because there's some, something on the order of a half a million veterans in our state. And when they get involved in certain low-level offenses, again, it may reflect um, a different problem, a need for certain services, um, that if you want to deal with the problem, you need to 
help them identify and receive those services. So that's that's the problem solving court approach. Okay, and that that you're looking to expand. That. Yes. Um, what is evidence based practice? What what are, what is what are evidence based practices, and why is that in your agenda, and why is that important for us to know? Well, that's a fair question because it's sort of a fancy term for making. Um, decisions or adopting practices based on actual data as opposed to just the way people have always done things or hunches. Mm -hmm. So evidence-based practices really um, describes looking at evidence and using that as a guide for your practices in a particular area. We've been very successful in the area of probation in looking at what kinds of conditions actually prevent people from recommitting an offense from you know, remaining productive in their communities. And based on that evidence, we've narrowed how we identify the conditions for probation. And what we found is it actually is more successful in protecting communities, in preventing recidivism, and avoiding unnecessary reincarceration, which creates jail costs and often, often itself is associated with a recurrence of crime once a person's released. So we're going to try to use that approach to look at other aspects of court operations, such as pretrial release. Interesting. Um, and I would imagine all sorts of it, the, the seriously mentally ill, uh, getting their hands on weapons, these sorts, all, all of these aspects, again, it sounds like it's a what, more scientific approach, mm -hmm. less, uh, less open to the vagaries of what someone's thinking at the time kind of thing. Is that what we're talking about here? Well, and, and, it, and it is a scientific approach in that it says let's, let's assess what has or hasn't worked based on the empirical record or based on the evidence as opposed to relying, um, as I said, on hunch or yeah. just the way things have always been done. The, uh, I know regulating attorneys is always a big when we do these programs. I mean, mm -hmm. Everyone wants to know, well, yeah, what are they going to, how, how are they watching them? So how do you regulate attorneys and, and, and how best do you promote higher standards? Well, um, your question reflects that one of the responsibilities of the Supreme Court is regulating the practice of law in our state. And we do that with the goal of protecting the public. And one thing that we're going to do under the new agenda is look at whether some of the rules that you know, determine who can practice and under what circumstances should be um, perhaps amended or um, rephrased in light of how the legal practice has changed um, with, with other changes in our economy and technology. Um, one of the other justices, Ann Timmer, is heading a commission that we've just formed that will be looking at that over the course of, of the next uh, several months with the goal of coming up with some recommendations by the end of the year. We also, over just the last year or so, under um, Justice Birch, the former Chief Justice, under her leadership, we restructured the attorney disciplinary system. and. Mm. And that seems to have improved how quickly the process works. And I think both from the perspective of the, the clients and the lawyers who are subject to discipline, I think the, the system is more um, transparent and more timely in its resolution of cases. We've got about a minute left here. Uh, this doesn't necessarily deal with the agenda. But just in general, this is a highly partisan era we're living in right now. And how do you keep that from trickling into the judiciary, especially when the public, the people that are supposed to be being served, lots of folks out there see an agenda. They see partisanship. They see the court did this because of that as opposed to finding justice. How do you keep that separate? Well, I think within our court, that's actually not been an issue. Um, our court has a high degree of, of collegiality. We have relatively few dissenting opinions. When the court divides, it's, it's very rarely on partisan lines. Um, I think our unanimity reflects that we're committed to trying to find uh, the right resolution and that it doesn't relate to politics or partisanship. I think our challenge as, as a court, and this is another issue we're trying to address in the agenda, is helping the public understand how we're different Mm -hmm. than, than other branches of government, which might appropriately be um, divided on a partisan or a political basis. But that's, that's not how the courts are meant to work, and that's not how our court in Arizona does work. And do you think that message is getting out there with people? I think it's 
begun to get out, but we as, our, we, as, we as the courts need to work harder at getting that message out. All right, very good. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you again. And Thursday on Arizona Horizon, find out how some MBA students are learning from the pros on how state spending and business intersect and see how one dad is helping other fathers deal with disabled children. That's Thursday evening, 530 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.